Welcome to this episode of TBR, a segment of the EVPL Footnotes podcast. TBR stands for To Be Read, that pile of books sitting on your nightstand, your bookshelf, or your dining room table just waiting to be read. We'll be highlighting a few of the new books, movies, Library of Things, and other materials coming to the library each month. I'm your host, Jamie, and with me today is Lori. Lori, tell us where you work and what your role is there. Hi, I'm Lori. Uh, I work at Red Bank, and I am the same Lori from the other episodes of the podcast. So you've probably heard me before if you listen to this. But if not, I am out at Red Bank, and I am a circulation worker. I do run a program out there, and I do this podcast, but mostly I'm circulation. Lori and I have worked together before, not just on the podcast, but she always brings a lot of fun to the show. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this. Yes, we actually worked together when you first started at EVPL, correct? I did, I did. We connected, we were just getting to know each other on a very just, you know, casual, professional level. And then suddenly, we both started finding out that we loved knitting. And that was, <laughs> that was all it took. A lifelong friendship made by knots. Yes, exactly. We are tied <laughs> together. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, I've talked on previous podcasts that I'm learning to spin and you got your wheel before I did. I don't know how your journey's going. It's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I bought the wheel um, and I do plan on getting around to learning how to spin soon or at a, some point in my life. Um, but it's kind of just... You know, I Sitting. understand that. There's there's the ambition, and then there's the time to pull off the ambition. Yes. Yeah, because, I mean, I barely have time to actually knit sometimes. Yes, that is also true for me. So I thought we would go ahead and jump into the new items that caught our attention as we were considering what's coming to EVPL in March. Do you want to go first? Sure. I was surprised before I jump into this too much that – we're getting 616 items throughout the system in just one month. Like, that's yes. a lot. Yes. That is a lot it's of It's exciting, materials. all the things that are available and accessible to the patrons of the library. Yeah, because that list wasn't even including DVDs or the Library of Things. Right. That was just book titles. Right. So that's exciting. So one thing that I am pretty excited for is a kid's graphic novel, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, there is a series by George O'Connor called The Olympians, where he does little individual comic books or graphic novels about each of the major gods in The Olympians. Okay. Um, and this one is the last one in the series, and it is a bit about Dionysus. Okay. Which I'm super curious how they're going to adapt a Dionysus story to be child appropriate mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we'll see how it goes i do know that this ep this last one i almost called it an episode uh, this last book is going to be told through the viewpoint of hestia okay who was the goddess that essentially like stepped down off of olympia to give dionysus a space up there okay all right see it's been so long since i've read up on my greek mythology mm -hmm. so i recognize the names and i'm sitting here as you're mentioning going I don't remember who they were or what they did. <laughs> I mean, the major ones, of course, that we all know, I do. Sure. But some of the ones like Hestia, I recognize the name. And then I'm like, okay, but I don't remember anything else about them. Hestia was the goddess of the hearth and home. Oh, right. So I thought it was something like that. That was what sprang into my mind, but it's been so long. I wasn't sure that was correct. So. Yeah. And she was worshipped on a very like familiar level by a lot of mm -hmm. Greek from what we know mm -hmm. um, uh, ancient mm -hmm. Greek indiv individuals, but she wasn't considered one of the major 12 by the end of okay the situation. So that's where Dionysus came in and he is the God of wine and madness. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of why I'm curious how they're going to make it child appropriate. Yeah, I that was what I was thinking. I thought, isn't he the god of wine? <laughs> yes. And so you're you're right that that might be an interesting ploy. That'll be I'll be curious about your take on that once you've gotten a chance to read it. Yes, I've loved all of those in the series so far. There's eleven so far, and they've all been great. I'm just going in random order okay. uh, here. So one of the first books that I noticed, and this uh, is going to sound a little bit different for my taste, but it's uh, a book by Bear Gillis, uh, the man who is in the TV show, Man vs. Wild, Running Wild, or You vs. Wild. It's called, it's a memoir, of course, mm -hmm. Never Give Up My Life in the Wild. Now, I'm not normally a reality 
TV show kind of person. No judgment to anybody who is. It's just not my jam. But the, the one kind that I like is, um, the wilderness survivalist kind of stuff. I just, I, I've always liked camping and hiking yeah. and things like that. So I find that interesting. So I'll watch, for example, alone mm -hmm. to see how these people manage. And I sit comfortably in my armchair and judge them for their <laughs> mistakes, <laughs> you know? And so because it's in that wheelhouse mm -hmm. and, and he talks about, um, for those who are familiar with the shows, some of the major events that happen on some of the shows, the behind the scenes sorts of things. And, the things that he's overcome in his adventures, but also in his personal life. And so I'm very interested in, in all of that. Yeah, I like memoirs, but I do think they are a type of book that you have to be really interested in that specific person. Agreed. Well, sometimes I will read something um, that's memoir, because I, I do enjoy memoirs, mm -hmm. that it might not be someone I know, but it's a, a setting or a place or a time that I feel like it'll give me a front row seat to some event in history. Sure. A child writing about what it was like to live through the Chinese Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. you know. And so I might not know who this person is, but that time and, uh, and that front row seat, as it were, to those experiences, I find those really quite fascinating. Sure. Yeah, they definitely are. And it's probably more accurate than my version of doing that, which is reading historical fiction that takes place yeah. in that time period. I like that too, though. And I feel like the, the thing I like about um, historical fiction is really good writers will do their homework oh, yes. on the history. And you can tell that in the writing. Mm -hmm. You absolutely can. And so then you feel not just like you're getting the facts, but you're engaged in the situation. You're feeling what is going down mm -hmm. as you're reading about escaping from a concentration camp or yeah. whatever. And, uh, and it's, it's not just the facts, the cold, harsh facts, which they are, but also just all the connections and the human reality of yeah. what it would have felt like to be in a situation, whatever's being described there. Yeah. I particularly like Michelle Moran, who writes a lot of historical fiction specifically about ancient Egypt. Oh. And I like her interpretations of the stories a lot. I don't know how realistic they are, Yeah, but you can tell she's definitely done a lot of research into yeah, ancient Egypt. I, I can really appreciate the writers who just really do their digging, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, Speaking of, and I know that this is going to be not coming in really soon, but I'm going to springboard off of that. And I know that eventually we will be getting in the DVD of Death on the Nile, the, the new movie that just came out uh, based on the Agatha Christie book, which I just got to see. And it was the cinematography and it was gorgeous. Yeah. And it was really quite amazing. And so um, that'll be a DVD to look forward and not anytime real soon, but in the not too distant future here. Yeah. Um, another kid's book that I'm interested in is called The Crab Ballet by Renee La Tulipe. I did not pronounce that correctly. She's French. I am so sorry. <laughs> I can barely speak English sometimes. Um, <laughs> But it's a picture book, and it just seems so adorable. The cover is a watercolor painting of crabs doing ballet. It's adorable. <laughs> That's the only reason and I'm interested in it. Sometimes, I know they say don't judge a book by its cover, but sometimes that artwork just pulls you right in. Yes. I mean, just the idea of little crabs doing ballet is adorable. It is. It is. <laughs> it makes me think of the the video with the hippos. And the little pink tutus doing their ballet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. And, oh, and I know nothing about ballet either. So I'm just like, oh, cute. <laughs> <laughs> My version of ballet is the Black Swan movie. Yeah. So, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next book that caught my attention is called After the Romanovs, Russian Exiles in Paris by Helen Rappaport. Ooh. Now... I love history and I read all over the place and it can be just really random what historical thing will catch my attention. But I've always had a, a fascination with the Romanovs and what became of that family mm -hmm. and all the events that surrounded that, you know, my take on what I, based on what I've read, my take on as a non historian, just mm -hmm. amateur interest um, is that the last czar Nicholas was not a bad man, but he was a, very poor ruler. Yeah, he just seemed 
oblivious. Right, right. And he was guided uh, inexpertly by his wife and other people. And he just made poor choices that, you know, instinct, I mean, um, what I want to say, escalated mm-hmm. tensions and issues that had already been around for so long. Anyway, that being said, so I have a real interest in that particular thing in history. And so what I was unaware of, but apparently after the 1917 revolution and the death of the Tsar and his family, um, conspiracy theories notwithstanding, many people, of course, fled Russia, especially those in the aristocracy and things like that. After the 1917 uh, revolution in Russia, many of the Russian aristocracy uh, fled Russia to find, you know, places that were safer for them. Of mm-hmm. course, that that was not a good time to be uh, an aristocrat in Russia. And so many of them wound up in Paris. And so what occurred there was you would have people and many of them when they did leave they were not able to take their wealth with them or any of those things so some were literally leaving with the clothes on their back yeah i had read once and i don't know how accurate this is that Mm -hmm. the romanovs when they were trying to escape the young women actually sewed a lot of jewels into their dresses yes according to what's been uh I've read in other books that is accurate when the family was shot. What was unnerving to the people shooting them was the girls seemed to be bulletproof at first. Yeah. Because the bullets were bouncing off the gems that were sewn into their corsets and clothing. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, when some of these people in um, that fled to Paris, you know, you, According to the book, the blurb of what I've read so far, you'd have princes, former Russian princes, riding, driving taxis yeah. in Paris. And their wives who were able to sew would be like working for some of the fashion houses just as a basic seamstress, you know. That has to be humbling. And I thought, you know, when I was hearing that description, I'm like, well, that would probably be a Bolshevik's dream come true, mm-hmm. seeing these aristocrats have to do labor like, you know, the people of Russia had had to do. And so it kind of describes in detail, according to what it says, the ones who did well, some did rise to success. And the ones who were just always into how we're going to get back. Mm -hmm. They were plotting and planning how they were going to overthrow the situation and go back. And then there's people who were just basically stuck in a cycle of poverty and always homesick for their homeland. And so I find that really interesting. I think that would be something that I would really enjoy reading. Sure. It's definitely a part of history that we don't talk about very often. Because typically when you think about the Rev- Russian Revolution, it is the Romanovs um, being chased out and then eventually killed. And then the more communist ideas that came up afterwards. Mm-hmm. But you don't really hear about the people that were chased out of Russia. Right, right. I hadn't really thought about it. It made perfect sense when I was reading the description of this book that that would, of course, be the case. Mm -hmm. It was just not something that had occurred to me until I saw that. So that really caught my attention. And while you were talking about it, I was wondering, I had to check on my phone. Surely, though, the Russian aristocracy has heard of the French Revolution, right? (laughs) They they chose France? I mean, I think they chose Paris. You know, at... Paris is that cultural center. Yes. And especially the aristocracy, many of them were quite taken with culture mm-hmm. and things of that nature. I probably felt at least more neutral ground than, than where they were currently standing. Definitely. I can and understand that. Peter, Peter the Great, mm-hmm. one of the things that he had done was really bring Russia into Western culture. He was quite taken with Western culture. And so he did a more uh, greater connection. Mm-hmm. I know Catherine Europe. the Great was really big on that as well. Right, right. And she followed right up after mm-hmm. Peter. Right, the Great. exactly. And so there was probably a lot of, especially for people with that kind of wealth, traveling in the European continent quite a bit. And so they probably went to what felt familiar outside of their own home country. That makes sense. So... But you're right. And I, I would imagine, though, even if the French Revolution had flitted across their mind at the time, they probably were too busy just trying to hit the road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so probably. They might not have 
weighed their options too closely at that moment as they were trying to get out of Dodge, as they say. Yeah, that makes sense. Sticking to the history theme that we've got going on, there is another book coming out this month that I am pretty excited about called In Defense of Witches, The Legacy of the Witch Hunts and Why Women Are Still on Trial by Mm -hmm. Mona Cholet. It is a historical and sociological book in which Cholet looks at past witch hunts throughout European history and the victims of those hunts. By focusing on the women that were accused of being witches, Cholet notices that there are three basic types, the independent woman, the woman who controls her own fertility, and elderly women. Cholet also explores how these same types of women are still disliked throughout modern day misogyny. Interesting. That Mm -hmm. sounds really fascinating. Yes. I am extremely interested in historical, how do I phrase this? Historical feminism? I am very interested in historical feminism, but I'm also incredibly interested in historical cases of mass hysteria. Oh, yes. Agree. Because there have been many instances where something just, there's a tipping point that's reached at a time of great tension and people do things that in their normal lives they would never, ever yes think of doing. And there is a argument to be made to connect a thread between historical witch hunts throughout Europe into the U.S. and then through what we consider now the 80s satanic panic. Oh, yeah. That mm-hmm. is actually starting to show its head again with book burnings. Yes. Um, yes. So I think that they're all – at least remotely related to each other. Yeah. And I just find that fascinating. I always found that um, many of the women labeled witches were basically the ones that just didn't quite fit in. Yeah. And it wasn't just women, although I think that this is going to be a very feminist perspective, Mm -hmm. but it was pretty much anybody that didn't fit into society. That's true. If somebody was disabled or had a mental illness or just had an attitude that people didn't like, they could be labeled a witch and prosecuted for it. Right. I like taking a peek into that history as uncomfortable as it can Mm -hmm. be. And especially the the aspect you brought out about mass hysteria, because it would be naive of all of us to think, oh, I would never do something like that. Oh, definitely. And it's like, you've got to lean in and learn those lessons of history so that you don't get swept along when that happens. Yes. So I think that's important. Yes. Well, and not to get too off topic, but the idea that the witch hysteria in Europe basically started from one paranoid king. Yeah. And then true. hundreds of years later was still, it still, was still going. Fall out. Still going. Yeah. A culture had been developed around it mm-hmm. and it continued. All right. Well, just shifting gears just a little bit, actually not a lot. I have looked at the book Wild and Wicked Things by Francesca May. This is one of those books that is a historical fiction, and yet it has elements not part of our real world. In this case, it's a naive woman visiting Crow Island. It's right after World War I. She's just there to settle her father's state and meet up with a, a for a best friend that she hasn't seen in a really long time. But this is a world that magic is a real thing. And it's not something she's interested in. In fact, she's really not wanting to get involved in any kind of magic, fake or real. Mm -hmm. But as that tends to go, she gets pulled in. Sure. And it's what comes of this entanglement Mm-hmm. And I I haven't read it yet, so I don't know how it's going to end. But the premise sounds really interesting. Yeah. Is this a young adult or an adult novel? Do you know? I believe it's adult. But you're right. It could be young adult. I only ask because I know that a lot of magic stories are very popular right now. Yes. And I've noticed the real uptick in yes. those types of titles right now. Yeah. Which... I enjoy reading, so I'm really happy about the wide selection of yeah. things to choose from. <laughs> Which they're expanding in the adult ar- arena as well. They're, we're true. finding That's more true. supernatural For stories. For example, Discovery of Witches is in the mm-hmm. adult section and that whole series. Yeah. I think there's also like the X-Hex that came out recently. Oh, I remember seeing that title, mm-hmm. but I, I had forgotten about that till you just mentioned it. Yeah. There's a, quite a number right now. Yeah. Well, speaking of young adult, I have another one 
<laughs> that's coming out. This one, is, I'm not going to lie, is a little bit of a guilty pleasure. <laughs> it is called The Fear by Natasha Preston. Okay. She writes young adult thrillers. Ooh. They're fun. They're uh-huh. not going to make you think too hard, but they're fun. <laughs> and I appreciate that. And this one is about a meme that goes around a small fishing town asking everybody, like, what the scariest way to die is. Ooh. And then people start dying in those manners. Oh, my. So it's about a young girl who sets out to find the killer, but finds herself basically in a nightmare. Okay. Well, speaking of guilty pleasure there, I just want to say, and I'm sure I've said it before, but I firmly believe this, a reading diet is well-rounded. Yes. Everything from vegetables to candy. (laughs) So I think you should just be able to enjoy it if you enjoy it. (laughs) Oh, I do. It's just one of those authors that while I'm reading it, I can tell what's going to happen chapters ahead. But it's still fun to read. Well, exactly. I mean, there's there's a difference between those ones that are just so predictable and not engaging mm-hmm. and the ones that I can still see where this is going, but this is just so much fun. Sometimes the descriptors and the characters, even if you can see what's coming, are just so much fun to engage with. Yeah, I think Natasha Preston's books are basically <laughs> young adult lifetime movies, oh, and I find that fun. That makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> Okay, so I do read all over the place, but I I really do love murder mysteries. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times I'll read a couple of other things, so stretch it, and then read another murder mystery. You know, and Mm -hmm. that's always going to be a part of my reading diet. There is a book called Murder in the Park by Jean M. Dams. A murder mystery set in the 1920s, and we're in the 2020s right now, and so that's kind of piqued my interest in looking back at what it was like 100 years ago in the 1920s. And this is a war widow, and her husband was lost, as I understand it, in the blurb in World War I. She's got a comfortable life, her family is well off, and she's comfortable just not doing, you know, just kind of getting into a normal life and not getting... Um, emotionally attached. Sure. And then this man that she's befriended in an antique store is murdered. And then one of her father's oldest friends looks guilty for it. And she doesn't believe this. And this, of course, draws her into finding out what happened to her friend and what really happened in regards to her father's friend. I do love period pieces. Mm-hmm. And I like both watching them and reading them. So I like historical fiction. I like feeling a part of that part of history, but also watch um, TV shows that are period pieces. One of my favorite series, which by the way, we have in the library, I believe on DVD, but definitely through Hoopla is the Miss Franny Fisher murder mystery. I love that one. And it is set in that same time period, although in Australia, Mm -hmm. so much fun because the music and the setting and the costumes. Yes. And, and the actress is fantastic. I really think she does a smashing job yeah. <laughs> of pulling off that character at that time. And so, so this kind of has all of those elements for me. It's got the murder mystery. It's got the period and uh, just that historical fiction aspect to it. So it's yeah. striking all my happy boxes there. Speaking of Miss Fisher, have you seen or heard of the sequel about her niece? Yes, yes. I only saw one season and I did watch it. I'm hoping another season will be produced, mm-hmm. but I I was thinking just the other night that I wanted to look and see if another season was coming out for that. I think there's a movie coming out, too, oh. or that recently came out, maybe, okay. about Miss Fisher. Because it, it kind of ended with the... With a question mark? Yeah. yeah. And people wanted to know, like, oh, did they get together? Will they? Won't they? Yes, yes. Um, and I think they answered it. Yes, Miss Fisher and the Crypt of Tears. Oh, yes. That actually came out about a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. And that I, I watched that. That was... Definitely a lot of fun. I think they do a really good job of producing those, and the characters are wonderful. And I mean, it's one of my favorite shows. Yeah. I have one more book on my list that I'm excited about because I'm a slow reader and I probably won't even finish all of these next month. <laughs> <laughs> but this one actually is the one I'm most interested in. And it is called Hell's Half Acre, the untold story of the Benders, America's first serial killer family Ooh. by Susan Jonas. If 
you don't listen to the other episodes. Mm -hmm. I am a huge fan of true crime and horror. Um, And they're not the same, but they do inter- they overlap. overlap. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And so this family seems to be the family that a lot of classic horror movies that feature killer families is based off of. Like the Hills Have Eyes, that kind of family. Okay. Okay. Because they were, in the late 1800s, a family living in rural Kansas. They were known by the people that lived around them. That Nobody really suspected them of anything crazy. And then they disappeared one night. They okay. just left. Okay. Nobody really knew where they went. They Spoiler alert, they've never been found. But when the community went to their land to see if there were any clues or if they could find out what happened, they just found... So many bodies. Oh, my goodness. So many bodies just buried everywhere. Wow. From what I have been reading, the cellar was just covered in blood. Wow. And they disappeared. Nobody's ever seen them since. I mean, obviously, they're dead now because that was late 18th century. Yes, yes. 18th century. We can all sleep a little easier knowing that that's probably true. (laughs) (laughs) True. But, I mean, they got away with it. Just a family killed together, disappeared. Nobody knew what happened. Wow. I wonder if the townspeople had no clue. I wonder what prompted them to disappear. I Yeah, I'm very curious about that, too. There are notes in the description that they may have had people helping them run away, which just intrigues me even more. Because sure. who's going to help a murder family disappear? And Did why? Did they know why they were helping them? Maybe they spun them a tale mm-hmm. of we just got to get out of town quickly and bad things are going to happen to us if you don't. And yeah. if you... If if you believe your neighbor, mm-hmm. then you might have done it innocently, not knowing what you were helping or who you were helping. So sure. That's that's a really good question. Maybe they just paid them well enough. <laughs> yeah, could be. It's also, you know, how'd they get away with it for so long? Yes. Yeah. That because, would be a real puzzle. Yeah. Because even here in Indiana, we have a history with Belle Guinness, who was a woman that murdered many men. We don't actually know how many she murdered. But she got caught eventually because you can't just have people show up to your house and disappear and never show back up anywhere else. Yeah, that tends to raise eyebrows. Yeah, even in that time period, you would have family at least asking about them. Exactly, exactly. All right, so the last book that I was going to mention is by an author I've read before. I like finding a good author who Mm -hmm. I enjoy because, you know, there's so many books to choose from, and I know that I will not read all the books I'd like to like read in my lifetime. So I'm like, oh, I've read this author, and I know I like her. So The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley is coming out. Now, if you haven't heard of her, she's definitely the murder mystery thriller Mm -hmm. kind of writer. And I read her book called The Guest List, which came out a year or two ago. That was really good. It was uh, set on a remote island for this destination wedding of this celebrity. And, but of course, there were dark backstories behind all the people that were invited. I mean, everybody wanted to be on this guest list. Mm -hmm. And so it was the unfolding of that. And so I enjoyed that very much and definitely worth a read for people who like the thriller murder mystery type of books. Like the Ruth Ware type? Yes. Yes. So The Paris Apartment, same author by Lucy Foley. She is staying with her brother she she's kind of in a tough spot so she contacts her brother who lives in Paris and says hey can I stay with you for a while and he reluctantly agrees but when she shows up he's not there she doesn't think much of it at first but then he just continues to be missing Hmm. and so now she's into where's my brother and what has happened to him and it goes through the different unique characters of the other neighbors in the apartment building as far as she's concerned, they're all suspects until she finds out what has happened to her brother. So that sounds really interesting to me. I, it does. I would read that again. Yeah. Or read that author again, I guess <laughs> is the best way to put that. So, all right. So I know we're out of books that we're excited about for next month or this month, excuse me, because we're recording this at the very end of February. Yes. Um, but there is a DVD that I'm excited about in a hesitant way. I am excited about the DVD Dexter New Blood. So they're bringing back the series they already have. And this is the first season since it came back. I hated the original ending. So I'm very curious how they're going to tell the story and how it's going to go. I have managed to avoid spoilers on the internet so far. 
So I'm very curious how it goes. We'll see. I can see that being a series that you enjoyed. I mean, yes. the, the original series. Mm-hmm. So I still think that out of all the TV shows I've watched, mm-hmm. the opening sequence for the original Dexter, probably the best opening sequence of any TV show. Okay. I love I it. I need to revisit that opening sequence. Yeah. He is basically getting ready for work uh-huh. and oh, making right. his breakfast right. and everything. Right. I remember that it's now. so threatening. <laughs> <laughs> These are just the smallest tip of the iceberg of the many new items, never mind all the things that are currently available at the library. So we hope everybody will come in, explore the books. There's new sections for both fiction and nonfiction for people to explore what has recently within the last few months come in. Mm -hmm. Those sections are continuously being added to. And so there's always going to be something. And of course, our staff is happy to help people find just the right book. It thrills me to help someone find just the right book to read. Yes, uh, every time. Yep. I, I have to dial back my giddiness so I don't frighten it. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a production of EBPL Footnotes. Join Jamie next month for TBR as she explores more new items coming to a library shelf near you.